Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly, the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. Thank you very much. My name's Dan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, This week on the show, we're talking about one of the most fearsome predators in the history of the world. It's also the biggest fish there's ever been. Doesn't sound too scary at the moment. I I promise it will blow your mind. This brutal beast is truly terrifying. You can hear all about them in a little bit. Also, we'll talk about a huge constellation of satellites up in the sky, why they've been sent up there, what they're trying to do, and we'll answer your questions as well. Today, they're on hand warmers, beef and light bulbs. That's in a sec. Before then, let's check in with the aliens who have crash-landed on this planet. They need the energy to get home. This is NNG. NNG's Energy Challenge. I thought you were packing the stack of power packs in the back. Hey, I was in charge of the handlebar radar on the sidebar of the space car. You were meant to be stacking the power pack. Well, if you hadn't been trying to pack 300 cuddly zoids and your entire collection of Spokatron cars, then maybe you might have realised. <laughs> we're going to be stuck on this horrible planet forever. How are we going to get home? All right, this isn't getting us anywhere. Calm down. There's plenty of energy on planet Earth. You just have to know where to look. Breathe. Breathe. All right. All right. Energy is everywhere in the universe, and that means... There's energy on Earth, too. That's right. There's energy on Earth, too. Of course there is. Energy is used for all sorts of things here on Earth, just like it is on planet Zog. Cooking, keeping warm, powering some particle laser pods. Well, the first two, yes, and yes. And they have these things called cars and trains. Not sub-particle laser pods, but yes, exactly the same. And hey, it could be worse. Hungry space dinosaurs? No, not hungry space dinosaurs. I mean, count yourself lucky we didn't arrive a few hundred years ago. These Earth dudes had to carry their own energy around back then. You mean they had to pack a stack of power packs in the back too? No, what I mean is they had to make their own energy when and where they needed it. Normally, it looked pretty much like this. Emergency! Emergency! Hypervolatile explosive gas! It's just a bonfire, G. For centuries, humans had to use wood or whatever was to hand to create energy. They would burn it to heat their houses and cook food. And power their subparticle laser pods? Uh, quite possibly, if such a thing existed, which is doubtful. Well, not much use, though, is it? We couldn't carry a load of wood around or carry a bonfire back to the laser pod. Can't argue with you there. Luckily, humans found some other types of energy along the way. Things called fossil fuels. Hey, maybe we can use them to get home. Let's check it out. This is a steam train. It's powered by coal. That's a type of fossil fuel. A couple of hundred years ago, humans figured out that deep underground were fossil fuels, like coal, which could be burned to power steam engines, factories and trains like this. Wow! Hidden under the ground. I wonder who hid it there. No one hid it. It just, well, was created there. Oil is another type of fossil fuel. From this sticky black liquid, humans make petrol for their motor cars. And then there's gas. Now that's a much cleaner and more efficient fuel. Did you say gas? Not that kind of gas. Well, our problems are solved. Fossil fuels sound perfect. Just the one to power the stack of power pods in the back. We'll be home in no time. Not so fast, mate. Fossil fuels have their drawbacks. Not only are they dirty and create a lot of pollution, they're not that easy to transport. And you have to saw them safely. And they need oxygen to burn. And there's not much of that in space. (laughs) Calm down, G. I haven't finished. Using coal, gas, oil and other fuels to create electricity is a way to make them much more versatile and useful. Brilliant! Watch out! Looks like we're going to fuse, G! Here it comes! Whoopee! I love a bit of fusion! Here it comes! Woohoo! NNG's Energy Challenge with support from National Grid. Find out more online at funkinslive.com slash energy. Let's get to your questions then, my favourite part of the show. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered, leave it as a review for our podcast over on the Apple Podcast Store. 
Uh, this is from Talia, who is 10 years old. Thank you, Talia. Who asks, how do hand warmers work? And I know what you mean, Talia. <laughs> Are you using them a lot at the moment? Uh, we're going to talk about the um, the non reusable ones because the reusable ones, the, the the science inside is like a little bit more complicated. So I thought we'd stick to the um, the standard hand warmers that you can buy pretty cheaply. Inside one is normally salt, water, carbon, and iron powder, and the iron powder is very important. Now, when you open a hand warmer, oxygen gets into the pouch. And it reacts with the powder that's in there to form a compound called iron oxide. You might know that compound better as rust. You know, the stuff that you get on your bike when you leave it outside. Now, that chemical reaction, when the iron powder meets the oxygen to make iron oxide, that chemical reaction uh, creates heat energy, and it's that that warms your hands. Thank you very much for the question there, Talia. Here's one from Jayinda, who asks, Why is eating beef bad? I guess you mean for the environment, right? Uh, A few reasons, really. Uh, They take a lot of space to keep all of the cattle. Uh, To keep them, to farm them, requires a huge amount of land. Around 30% of the world's ice-free land is used to make livestock. Uh, A lot of rainforests and healthy trees are also cut down to make the space for these farms. A study in 2018 found that 12.4 million acres of forest is cleared each year to make space for livestock. It's one of the main causes of the Amazon deforestation uh, over in South America. Um, The real problem, though... Apart from that, with keeping cattle and the beef, is farts. Not just farts, particularly burps. You see, when cows burp, they release the gas methane, and that affects the ozone layer, it breaks it up. And uh, scientists say uh, that affects how much the climate is changing and how much the world is heating up. 10% of greenhouse gas emissions come from cows. Uh, They're a huge reason, uh, experts think, about climate change. They contribute towards it a lot. So that is pretty much why, uh, Jay and experts think that eating beef is bad for the environment. Thank you for the question. And lastly, Jay Mary Mitch uh, wants to know what powers a light bulb. I mean, electricity, really, but there's a bit more to it than that. It's all to do with the filament that's inside the light bulb. You know, usually the little tiny coil that you see in the middle, uh, it, it's it's uh, like a, a bit of metal that they've kind of pushed into a spring. Now, metal is a conductor of electricity. It lets it pass through it. The filament is held in the middle of the bulb and it lets that electricity run through it, but it makes the electricity work hard to do it. Now, because it's working hard, the filament gets hot and it burns white and bright. And that is what powers the light bulb and helps you see. Thank you very much for the question. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. The Fun Kids Science Weekly. And we've got huge news, big space news right now. 20 floor planets have been discovered to have conditions more suitable for life than our very own planet Earth. How can that be the case? We're going to find out. Professor Dirk schulz mokoch is an astrobiologist from Washington State University, and and he did the study. Uh, Dirk, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, Now listen, you discovered these 24 planets out of over four and a half thousand that we know of. What were you looking for? What are conditions that are suitable for life at all? Well, well, first of all, we found only candidates that may be suitable. So we don't really know for sure whether any of those are in fact more habitable. But what we looked for is planets that might have more biomass and biodiversity than our own planet. And so we looked both in a solar system setting. That means what kind of host star these planets would have. And we found out that, for example, K stars, great K dwarf stars, are um, uh, likely more suitable than uh, uh, stars like our sun, which are uh, G stars. And we looked back in the natural history of our planet and found out that certain environmental conditions are also more favorable for life. What are those environmental conditions that help an ecosystem? Well, you know, you can even look today on uh, at our planet. Where is the most biomass and where is the most biodiversity? We won't find it in the desert, neither in Antarctica nor uh, 
in a warm desert like the Atacama Desert, but we find it usually in jungle areas. So if it's warm and wet, uh, that is really a preferential for life, to have lots of life and lots of different life. Uh, then also uh, coastal areas are very productive. So if you have a really long coastline, this is also helpful for life. And uh, there's other things too. So if the planet is slightly older than Earth, or at least as old as Earth, we also think then there's more biomass and biodiversity because that has increased during the natural history of our planet. Now here on Earth, we're equipped with loads of the stuff that we need to live. Uh, there's oxygen in the air, we've got water. Um, is there a way of finding out whether these planets, whether that would have the right things in the air to uh, sustain life as we know it? Um, well, in principle, um, we can find out, but it still will be a time, uh, still take some time because it is simply um, that our screening abilities uh, looking at exoplanets are not as sophisticated. We just starting to uh, can identify certain compounds in the atmosphere, mostly uh, a planet that has carbon dioxide. Oxygen is already a little bit more challenging. And to get a really uh, better picture, we need higher resolution. But uh, we, will, we hope that we have that soon with uh, uh, some new missions and uh, better telescopes in, in space. Well, let's talk more about that. When you were looking at these planets, Dirk, how were you looking at them? How are you able to find out the compounds that are in the atmosphere of a planet that's light years and light years away? Well, uh, the thing is, uh, we don't know those yet. So we cannot say what uh, the compounds are in the atmosphere. What we have from those planets is usually uh, what kind of stars I orbit. We have the information, how far are those away from the stars? So that means, are those in the habitable zone? Meaning, is, uh, is, are those the right conditions uh, that uh, water would be in the liquid form on its surface? And uh, we also have some kind of idea about the temperature of that planet. We have an uh, idea about the age of the, of the system, the planet and the star. So uh, we uh, can accumulate this kind of uh, information and say, okay, uh, if those conditions are set, we have uh, planets that are favorable, that could be very habitable or super habitable to life. But that doesn't mean that they are. If you look at uh, our moon, for example, our moon is a dead rock in space, but it is actually in the same zone as Earth is, in the habitable zone. And it is uh, uh, from the temperature regime and from it has the same age, but Earth and our moon couldn't be different. So there is no guarantee, even if all the parameters are right, that they, those planets are habitable or that there's life on those. You talk about the moon there, Dirk. Um, why are the moon and the Earth so different? As you say, we are, I mean, in space terms, pretty close together. Um, we're the same sort of distance away from the sun. We've got water, we've got heat, we've got light. Why is it so different on the moon? Uh, well, there's several reasons to it. One of the big reasons is really that the moon is tidally locked to the Earth. So it basically shows always the same side to the, uh, to the Earth. And the, uh, then the moon uh, degassed and lost its atmosphere early on. It could be that since Earth is bigger, that it actually took much of the moon's early atmosphere as well. So uh, without an atmosphere, uh, the moon is really hot on the side that uh, shows to the sun. Um, and on the other side, it's very, very cold. So, and we have the uh, fortunate uh, circumstance that we have a relatively thick atmosphere. This really thick atmosphere is really the lifeline for our planet. Without that, we wouldn't have any life on our planet either. It also protects, protects us from radiation. 
And the other thing uh, that is uh, a big factor is that Earth is liquid inside. It has this kind of outer core that is churning and building up a large magnetic field. And we have the whole planet basically um, recirculating in what is called plate tectonics. We have new crust created and somewhere else subducted. So that really recycles everything. Now, we found these planets that you think they, uh, they might have an ecosystem which could sustain a form of life. What happens next, Dirk? How do we find out at all whether there might be life on these planets that are so far away? Well, um, the thing what we have to look is that uh, we, we actually get a closer look at those planets. And this will happen with uh, new missions like Starshade, um, where you put space telesco uh, telescopes into space and uh, go with a close observation. Our point is to select candidates out that might be more likely to uh, contain life. See, we have now uh, close to five, we know uh, right now close to 5,000 exoplanets. So there's no way that we can all of them uh, really analyze and look close to it. So we have to uh, prioritize or select certain targets. And the ones that we selected um, or that we suggested, that would be uh, good targets for further investigations. But we do need those telescopes uh, uh, to really investigate further. Is the investigation zooming in on the telescopes to see if there's anyone wandering around or is it a bit smarter than that? Well, the first the telescopes first have to get into space. Uh, there, there's several missions, uh, Plato, uh, Starshade, I find it very exciting because with Starshade, uh, you actually have one planet has its own pixel size. So actually you can view the planet even if it's only with one pixel uh, because all um, uh, all telescopes so far can only see the star and the planet together. Of course, with that, it's very difficult to extract the information and to say to, okay, what is the star, what is the planet, and uh, how might that combine? If you start with having uh, one pixel only the planet, then this gives you information, uh, much better information. And of course, the next step would be to get several pixels to see, for example, Okay, has the planet uh, uh, maybe uh, an ocean uh, on its surface? Does the planet have maybe uh, uh, polar caps like our planet? So, so we are only at the beginning, really. It's baby steps. Now, you've said many times, Dirk, that your mission is to search for life in the universe. Do you think that you will ever complete that mission? <laughs> um, well, you know, uh, I, I think for uh, any life outside of the solar system, this will still take decades till we are for sh uh, sure, for certain there. Unless, you know, we are really fortunate and we uh, are getting contact with intelligent life uh, through radio uh, signals or something like that. Uh, but otherwise, just from uh, exoplanets and looking through the telescopes, I think that will take still decades. So my answer there would be no. However, what I hope is that we, uh, at the same time, we're working very hard to find life on Mars. And I'm working uh, with my colleagues too at life detection instrumentation, for example. We're looking for life at en Enceladus, at uh, Europa, at Titan. And so those targets within our solar system are much closer. Sure, at those places, you know, we won't find animal or plant life or something of that complexity what uh, we have on our planet. But, you know, we as astrobiologists would be already very excited to just find microbial life, you know, bacteria that are on an alien planet. And this is something feasible, uh, and maybe even likely to find within our own solar system. Now, lastly, Dirk, um, we see on telly and in movies and in sci-fi books and stuff, and I know that you've written your own sci-fi books, uh, aliens, they tend to look, 
you know, like a, like a, a bit weird, a bit like us, but a bit kind of green and slimy most of the time. <laughs> In your mind, knowing what you know of uh, the, so, the, the universe and your search for life, what do you think life on other planets will take the form of? Uh, well, you know, if we distinguish between phenotype and genotype. So, geno is uh, uh, the genetics, what is based on. Phenotype is how the organism is adapted to its environment. So, it really depends a lot of the environment. Just think about Earth, how, what kind of different life forms we have. Compare yourself to a tree or to a slime mold or so. Uh, all look very, very different, yet the genetic, there are genetic similarities. So, um, you know, if we know the environment on that planet, we can deduce or think about it, what the form could be, how that organism would look like. Um, it depends to uh, what kind of complexity you get at. If you look at uh, really animal or plant-like life or fungal, uh, large fungi or something like that, um, you would probably see uh, start to see some similarities, especially as it becomes you know more complex or more intelligent. You know, crows, elephants, apes, dolphins, uh, octopi are all relatively intelligent. So you would. I think about some similarities that there may be a, a central functioning system like a brain and a head. Although you have to be kind of careful again too, because uh, a lot of neural activity and neurons in octopi, for example, are within the arms. They are not all in the head. So uh, there are a lot of different possibilities. And uh, for us uh, to distinguish and say, okay, that will look like this or that, it's really um, very speculative. I can't really pin it down on that. It would be more, uh, like I said, appropriate to say, what kind of functions these organisms could do? How would they work? And uh, what, they, what they can do in the environment? Amazing. Professor Dirk schultz thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having me. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're headed into the past to have a look at one of the ocean's most fearsome predators ever. The Megalodon ranks among the largest carnivores in the history of life on Earth. They are the largest fish ever. They were an enormous megatooth shark. They patrolled the oceans more than 3 million years ago. They grew to 18 metres in length. Now, their teeth were as big as tall as, as probably your arm is long, probably bigger, probably more like your mum and dad's arm is long. In fact, their name, Megalodon, means large tooth, and they had a lot of them. Their jaws were lined with 276 teeth, and they could snap them shut with supreme power. Now listen to this, how's this for a comparison? A human chomps down with a bite force of around 1,300 newtons, which is the measurement of force. A great white shark today has a bite force of around 18,000 newtons. So over 10,000 times how strong we bite. Experts think that the Megalodon had a bite force of up to 180,000 newtons. 10 times more powerful than a great white Incredible. It had a flat, squashed jaw with a small nose, usually stuck to warmer waters. And scientists have found recently that even when uh, these creatures were young, they were terrifying. Baby megalodons were thought to be born at the same size as a fully grown human. Oh, this frightening beast from the past, the biggest fish ever, goes straight onto our dangerous stand list. Let's take a look inside your body now, see how everything works and how you get better with Professor Hallux. Hallux's Physiology Fix-Up. Sounds like a party in a pet shop. 
What are you up to? I've been working out a way to improve the cells we have in our bodies. Cells? Yeah, you know, cells. They're the building blocks for our bodies and there's a terrific range of them. Different cells have different jobs. So, what's with the mice? These aren't your common garden mice. I rescued these from a Russian circus. See how clever they are. They can juggle, form mouse pyramids, and even drive tiny cars. So you are proposing to replace the cells in the body with trained mice? Well, compare the mice with the human cells in that dish over there. The cells don't look terribly impressive, do they? Cells are incredibly impressive. Are you absolutely sure that these mice could do all the jobs that our cells do? There's only one way to find out. That's to learn more about the physiology of cells. Organs and systems in our bodies have a number of jobs to do. They're able to do all these jobs because of the way they are constructed and the way they work with other parts of the body. Loading physiology file. Cells. Job 1. The human body has as many as 200 different types of cells. They do a whole range of jobs, one of which is transport. For example, red blood cells transport oxygen and nutrients around the body. See, my trained mice can drive a car. They could carry a load of oxygen around. Physiology fail. It's a mouse in a car. Bother. Cells. Job two, conducting electricity. For example, nerve cells pass messages between them using electricity and muscle cells exchange electrical signals with the brain. This tells muscles how to move bodies. Physiology fail. Why? Mice are not known for their ability to conduct electricity. Well, not more than once. Cells. Job three, storage. Cells can store vital minerals and chemicals which the body needs to survive. For example, liver cells store important fats and bone cells store calcium. Whereas your Russian trained mice can only just about store a few nuts in their gob. Physiology fail. All right, all right. Not my greatest idea. To be honest, cells might be some of the tiniest parts of our body, but they really can be the most versatile. Even more versatile than juggling mice. Sorry, mice. So here's a question, a sensible question for you. How do all these different cells know which job they have to do? Well, inside every cell, there's some DNA, the building blocks of life. It's like an instruction book. It tells each cell how to grow and what to do. And the more we know about cells and how they work, the more we can help when things go wrong, right? You've hit the spot, Nanobot. Medicines can change the way cells behave or help them to do their job more effectively. Knowing about cell physiology can even help us to grow new new organs. That sounds a bit like Frankenstein. Not quite as dramatic as that. You see, most cells can only ever grow into one type of cell, but some cells can turn out to be a variety. They're called stem cells. Scientists can decide which sort they grow into. They're helping us find ways to repair organs and tissue, or even grow new ones. All sounds much more sensible than getting mice to do the job. Hey, I happen to like mice. Halux's Physiology Fix-Up, with support from the Physiological Society. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Halux. Let's get this week's Science in the News. And some quite sad news to start us off. Eight gorillas have tested positive for COVID-19 at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Now, some of the gorillas have shown symptoms, including coughing, uh, but good news now, none appear seriously ill. The, ex- the executive director of the zoo, Lisa Pearson, said the troop remains quarantined together and they are eating and drinking as well. Also, US greenhouse gas emissions turned below their level in 1990 for the first time as a result of the pandemic. As people travelled in cars and planes less, emissions were down and energy emissions fell sharply too due to a decline in the use of coal. Uh, And finally, the European Commission says it wants its newly proposed satellite mega constellation to be working by 2024. This is the huge network of satellites in the sky that will give broadband to parts of the continent that normally can't be gotten to. That's what's happening hopefully in 2024. Later, it will power services such as self-driving cars. And that is it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly. 
thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you want to ask a question to the show, you need to do that over on Apple Podcasts. Find us on there. Leave it as a review. Drop us five stars so I can see it and leave your name as well so I can say hello. While you're on Apple Podcasts, it's one of the best places that you can hear loads of science and, and other podcasts that we do. Uh, you can also hear them on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app at funkidslive.com